days and still just be scratching. Meyer, and this, this one I get such a kick out of because this is my experience with it. Three years ago, every time I go to Switzerland, I sit with Billy and we talk. And sometimes because you can learn more from what he's published and what Wendell and everybody's put together than you can sitting and talking for 15 minutes, right? Because what's he going to tell you in 15 minutes when you can read for hours? So sometimes we tell jokes to each other. Sometimes I talk about the hinges and the doors and how their property's built and everything works with nature. So I'm sitting in his office with him, like you just saw at that little computer. And he, I look over to the side, just to the right of where he, you saw him there, he's got a printer. And there were a bunch of sheaves of paper in there. And he says, oh, yeah, 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 that. He says, um, I write the spiritual teaching for the play Iron people. And Quetzal comes here, and he picks up the papers, and he goes back to the ship, and he takes it back to their world. He says, but you know, this is very time consuming for them. I said, oh, I'm sure. He says, so next week, this is three years ago, he tells me, Zafanat Paneak is coming. He's going to fix my computer so when I type in the teachings, they go to a separate server and they send them to a little disk monitoring the earth and that sends them back to the Pleiades. I go, Zafanat Panay is coming, great. So we talk, the next May, I'm there, and this a year has passed, a lot of stuff has obviously gone under everybody's bridge and I thought, you know, I gotta see if I can trick this guy because maybe he makes this stuff up somehow. I said to him, so uh, Billy, how did uh, Zafanat Panayak ever show up last year? He said, yes, yes, of course he did. He says, you know, I write the spiritual teaching for the play Iron people, and <laughs> Quetzal always has to come and pick the papers up and take them. He tells the story. He says, Zafanat Panayak, he came and he fixed my computer. Now I just type into it, and it goes to a separate server, and it goes to this little disk that monitors above the earth and it sends it back there. I said, oh, that's great. He says, yeah, but there's a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, he screwed something up on my computer. Now he's got to come back and fix that. So now he's got an IT from outer space, right? <laughs> so last May, third year, I'm sitting with him. I'm thinking, OK, we've got another year down the tubes here. The guy has to be a genius if he can keep track of lies like this. So I said, so Billy, how's your computer working now? Oh, yeah, Zafanat Panayak, he came, he fixed it. You know, because I write the spiritual teach. He does the same. So we went to Switzerland, this director buddy of mine and I, in September to make a, we're doing a documentary, and I'll show you a little bit on it, on Meyer and the people. And I said to my buddy Jack, a German guy, I said, Jack, um, I've had this experience with Billy with this thing. I'm going to ask him again. Just He tells the same thing with one addition. He says, well, you know, I write the spirit, same thing. He goes, and Zafanat Panayak, he says, now all I have to do is type in a code, and it goes to a separate server, to a disk above the earth. To the play. So I'm thinking, you know what? I could ask this guy this question for the next 10 years. I'm going to get the same answer. Marcel Dobrik, a senior scientist in chemistry at IBM, had been carefully analyzing the tiny metal fragments Sinyasa had given Billy. Metallurgical analysis had revealed the presence of the rare earth element, thulium, but it was through the lens of a scanning electron microscope that Vogel made his most amazing discoveries. I could not explain the type of material that I have and its discreteness by any known combination of materials. I could not put it together myself as a scientist. If I were to take these combinations and put it into a furnace, melt it, and pour it out and pull a little ink it, I would see that all of these elements present here in any one area. But I don't. I see this discrete bits of material. Now, it can only happen by some form of a cold fusion process where you have the elements present and you fuse them together so they still maintain their identity but they interpenetrate into one another. It's also a challenge because I showed it to one of my friends who was a metallurgist and he shook his head and said, I don't see how you can put it together. And that's where we are right now. And I think it's important that those of us who are in the scientific world sit down and do some serious study on these things instead of putting it off as figments of people's imagination. Could I, uh, could I say this material is extraterrestrial? It doesn't look like anything that we've made here. At this moment, I would feel very much inclined to accept what was given to me as being true. I respect the people I've met so far, their integrity, their willingness to work. Mr. Delatosa and his work on photography, and Mr. Stevens, the way he has 
done his best to have given me specimens. We have all done this for one thing, to serve and to find out what, what truth. That guy was the in inventor of magnetic tape for IBM. Right. He was a certified, I mean, he was a genius. And it's interesting, the skeptics, this poor guy attacked. I had made a typo in something I posted on the website where I had said that Vogel used a scanning electron microscope to discover thulium, which was an error. Well, the poor skeptic, despite having all this material for six years, never reads the, your books, never does the, the homework, because clearly in you, the documentation in your preliminary report, they speak of we have to use energy dispersive x-rays and x-ray uh, diffraction or something and spectral analysis. And Stevens says all that about how they discovered thulium and rhenium and argon gas and all these other elements. And in another segment of the metal analysis tape, he actually shows the spectral analysis mm -hmm. of thulium. So the skeptics are just, they don't know it yet how badly sunk they are when this comes out. He, um, said, in effect, as you heard, that this has to be a cold fusion process or something done in outer space. And we still don't have it. In a vacuum. He said, in a vacuum. Bogo said the only way this alloy could exist would be to, through a cold fusion process in a vacuum. Because there's no bubbles, no ash, and the mix is perfect, perfectly blended. And, and, and the only sense. cold fusion process we have is electrolytic. And, and it's not in a vacuum. He found on so, uh, some of the faces, he found machining a very discreet, uh, obviously mechanically uh, precise machining that he says must have been done with some form of a laser that he doesn't have access to. So he's got a metal sample that's simultaneously crystalline with every element in the periodic table, including thulium and rhenium and all the rest of the stuff, and micro-machining, and it's given to him by Wendell Stevens, who received it from a Swiss farmer. So we're laying a lot of things on the table. Again, this is why can you hard prove anything? Well, it's up to you. That you playing, Mark? No. We are here on Earth to live our lives so that the consciousness can evolve, so it can collect knowledge and wisdom, build love, freedom, and harmony. So that the human can learn he stands here in the material life on Earth, exactly as other human civilizations do on other worlds and in the entire universe. My name is Eduard Albert Meyer. My name is Edward Albert Meyer, but around the world I'm simply known as Billy. I received this name when I was in Tehran on my journeys. Since then, this name has remained with me. Old uh, side parish, this is an old Here's a souvenir that they had nailed, they had nailed on to the main door to my home. It's a nephew dog, he will be put down. Shortly after they had nailed this letter to my door, there was another attempt. And they tried again to catapult me out of my life and shot out. Was Leben befördert und wollen und hat auf mich geschossen. Und hier ist der Platz, als ich allein. And here is the place that I once was told to come for a contact. Jacobus was here with me and two other men in the late night hours. They shot at me from down there. Da hat man von hier drunter äh, hat man auf mich geschossen. Äh, das habe ich aber Tage zuvor. But I had dreamt about this days before and had hung a metal plate in front of my chest under the jacket and an agenda. And the shot went into the agenda and into the metal plate. Genau in die Agenda rein und in die Metallplatte und so hat es mir das Leben gerettet. Durch einen Traum, den ich zuvor hatte. And so my life was saved through the dream I had. Because I always, always have dreams which show me events that will come true in the future. Can we all have dreams like that? 
consciousness können eigentlich alle Menschen. Actually, all humans can have these kinds of dreams if they concentrate and start to steer their dreams. And when they make themselves somehow capable to have visions through their dreams, they will have truth dreams and so on and so forth. But it depends naturally upon the human concentrating heart and using his consciousness to truly direct the energies and powers that come out of the consciousness. Up to the left side over here where the road goes into the forest, Langholz is situated there and that also has gotten us some great photographs. Is that where the log pile was? Yeah. I, I recognize that. Where are we going now, Billy? <clears throat> Down there to the lower satellite where we are able to make photographs of Semyaze's beam ship. That's like the most famous idea. Yeah, that's the one on the cover of the, of the big picture book, right? Yeah. It's, it's also our movie poster is taken from that, too. I have to tell you about this title. So, allegedly, a year or two ago, maybe, maybe a little more, there was a contest on the play Iron Planet Era. And the contest was for someone to create a slogan that embodies what Billy Meyer's work and mission on Earth is. And the winner of the contest would get to come and meet Billy in his office. <laughs> And there's some funny stories about meetings with Billy in his office, too. Anyhow, someone won the contest, and the slogan is, The Silent Revolution of Truth. And the winner was an 11-year-old girl. And about, I guess, a year or two ago, whenever it was, she, Pata brings her in, and I saw a, uh, <coughs> an unofficial translation of the, of the contest. It's just very, it's very... You, it wouldn't have to be somebody from outer space. You know, it was like, it's a pleasure to meet you, sir. Uh, you know, and it's my pleasure to meet you, young lady, you know, blah, 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 blah. And she says, well, I'm, I, I feel we may never meet again, but I'm so glad to have had this opportunity to come and, you know, visit with you. A couple of times when I talk to Billy, he'll talk about the people, you know, the play are and what it's like. And he says at one time, Patak came with these three young women. Uh, one was 162, one was 230. They live longer. So, and he says it was they're very nice. He says they're very different than we are. They, I said, well, what are they like? And he says they're just very different. They're they're human beings. He said, and it's just a, what he what what he said without words. The pain of the comparison <clears throat> was was palpable. And he says after we had been introduced and had a short conversation, they wanted to go look around the property and, and look in the bird cages and things. And he said, so I told him to be careful. He said, well, don't worry. We will screen ourselves again so no one can see us. To being objective, OK? And you do it through questioning, learning, and evidence. Which is, which is, which is <clears throat> you're saying. Do the hard work. What, 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 what is provable? Right. You know, what, you know, and this, what, case, you know, this case can do that. I mean, hey. Look, Elijah was taken up to heaven by a chariot of fire in a whirlwind. What, what was, was that? that? What was it that Ezekiel saw that had a rim with spokes and eyes on it and had a wheel within a wheel? I mean, and what was it that lifted up from the center of the village and the glory of the Lord and set down on the eastern mountain? If this man, a primitive man, is describing to the best of his ability an advanced machine for which he has zero reference point. Correct. Right. He'd never seen a bicycle or a flashlight. Correct. Right. And he gets it pretty darn close. The fact that he didn't go nuts is pretty good. So he's describing this thing, but it's the whole mystique and mythicism and the fear. Because the thing that religion implants isn't just, well, believe this, believe it or else. Yes. And that's, that's the thing, because once the fear has got you mm, like that, that's the thing that a person is going to have the hardest problem with. Well, what if this, I'll be punished for eternity. I'll be dipped in a molten lake like a marshmallow and hot chocolate for the rest of eternity, you know, <laughs> or whatever. You know, I liked an argument one time when, when Semyasi had said that there's no religion that's valid, all false. And she said, even your term describes it accurately. You you spell it religion, R-E-L-I-G-I-O-N. 
She says that two Greek words means tying yourself to the past, re legion. Mm, yeah. She said you should even be, you're even quoting it correctly if you, if you spelled it R-E-L-E-G-I-O-N, that's re legion, you would have tying yourself to the future. Eon. You should be yeah. Eon yeah. instead yeah. of I-O-N. <coughs> huh. And that's so right. she said even your that's term right. describes your situation. You're all false. Yep, you're tying yourself to the past. I know. Yeah. You know, when people ask me, what, you know, do I believe in God? I just tell them, I don't have to decide that now. And it flabbergasts them. But it's, it's a way to just deflect the criticism. And then the rest you know? of her argument was hmm. that uh, our religions require us to believe dogmatically by blind faith alone. That's right. And she said that, that we should be, should know what we believe. That the whole thing is <clears throat> to know what you believe, not accept somebody else's belief, because to that degree you're binding yourself to somebody else's ideas. Or mistakes. Yeah. yeah. So you know, it's curious that their prophecies, I mean, George should have heard this, is they're saying there's only going to be one more pope. Yeah. I mean, that is not too far away. Yeah. <laughs> is that from them or is that is that from that's somebody else? Well, actually, that's, that's, that's where religion as an institution collapses and yes. something else takes yeah. its place. Common sense. Right. And they say that... Well, you know what? <clears throat> Maybe this dinner is the start of that. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, because yeah. the Pleiadians argued that, that nobody needs an intercession between him much. and the creation. Correct. That the creation is in that's everybody. <clears throat> and you, you don't need somebody else to, to meet it, to, to get to it. Right. And so intercessors were introduced by men to control men. And it was part of Right, it. control, right. Men to exactly. control men. All control, yeah. yeah. Well, it was really part of the sky people. that they, they initially introduced religion, right, to control the ignorant human beings? Yeah, absolutely. And the group Let that believed that they were gods. The they, they made them believe they were gods, right? Yeah, there is no such thing as a, right, as but, a but true god. There, the, the creation, which is everything. Right. Right. But if, if, you, if you give it a term, you've personified it, and then it's not correct anymore. But they're, but they're one of the reasons they're here anyway. is to try to correct their own correct their mess own, ups. Yeah, because they, the, they, 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 they yeah. made some mistakes in their earlier years with deliberate, us. Deliberate, and they're trying to undo it. Yeah. They, oh, they did it deliberately. Well, they're yeah, they up. set themselves up as gods and let us let the they let us believe they were gods. Primitive people believed that they were gods. Got it. Okay. Pretended to be. And then you had the Bafath, the splinter group of the Play Iron, who were based underneath the, the, uh, the Giza Plateau for a long time, who didn't get run off the planet until like 1978 or so. And they were the lineage of Jehovah and the different uh, gods within that lineage that had come uh, down, Kamagal, Jehovah, all these things, um, who had been run. They instituted blood sacrifices in religions. Yeah, those personified gods were very ruthless. And, yeah, they were. And, and <clears throat> Horrible. And you know what else it, it makes you think about? See, this is where this whole E.T. thing. If these were beings, let's say this, these gods that were here, the Bafath, extraterrestrial humans that could travel in space, they settled here to control a bunch of primitive people? So there's got to be a demystification of space travel and extraterrestrials and all this stuff. We're just all evolving. These people that were more evolved, certainly technologically than we, bound themselves to control us on this planet, set in motion terrible things. They were a driving force behind Hitler and other things like this. So is it, is it enough that somebody can travel in space or is an extraterrestrial? Or is it really about what the Meyer case is saying, spiritual development and evolution? That's what it's about. <clears throat> what do they say about, I mean, because you had mentioned other races that, that are here and, and have, I mean, I think you I remember, remember reading in your book that 167 yeah, or some big number. Many have come and gone. Many have yeah. come and gone. Yeah. I mean, but I mean, what <clears throat> I mean, what do they say is contemporary? The ones that are here. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's play arms. Yeah. Yeah. There's yeah. nobody else visiting us, right? Isn't yeah. that, that what they're saying? They've left. Basically. They've all left. Basically. The the expeditionaries are all gone. Yeah, we're on our own again. There may and, be, and they're worried about whether we're going to survive because we create our own future as we go, right? But what? Well, what about you know the Greys and all of the other stories? Are they saying that's all bogus? And well, they don't want Meyer to waste time 
pursuing other stories, and so they they tell him that they're not real, or if they're not real, that they're misperceptions. They do everything they can to defuse his energy, to take to keep him focused to keep on keep him focused on what they want him focused on. Yeah. Yeah. Let me read this to you from the first contact in reference to other civilizations. All right. So there exist sorts which acquired much knowledge and freed themselves from their life regions. And they also travel through the universe, and here and there they come to the earth. Many of them are raster na or rather nasty con contemporaries, contemporaries. Yeah, and live in a certain barbarism which is still worse than yours. You ought to be on your guard before these because they often attack and destroy everything that comes in their way. They have even destroyed whole planets or beaten their inhabitants into barbarous bondage. This is one of our missions to warn the earth human of these creatures. Let this be known to the earth humans because more and more the time approaches when a conflict with thieves it's becomes unavoidable. unavoidable. Mm -hmm. That is scary. Yeah. Yeah, but you know what? Well, there's things more scary than that. Just re read the, the last prophecies for the next 100, 200 years. Yeah, thank you. You mean the ones from um, well, Jeremiah? Contact number 215. Okay. That, that oh, I think I describes the Third World War and the Fourth World War. 251. The, yeah. 251. Was yeah, that a separate book? By the Fourth World War, we, our whole system of weapons and combat instruments has changed. We've got away from projectiles and are using rays and beams. But well, that's even, in even more prophecies. They mentioned that as well. And yeah, and, there's, and it's in 251. You can read 251 for free if you go to my newsletter archives, July okay. 2005. It's the three-part thing in there. Okay. All right. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, there's, there's some wicked stuff in Starting here. Starting to wind down, Wendell? Wind and, how about, down, how yeah. about some coffee? Oh, that would be good. You got it. Let's get some caffeine. How yeah, about yeah. you? Well, well, or my I don't know. That might keep me awake. Well. <laughs> I mean at night. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm awake now. Don't worry. <laughs> I just look like I'm asleep. <laughs> right, we'll get you some coffee. Yeah. And uh, Let's see. The, uh, yeah, so, I mean, it's, there, there could be other things, like you said, that they, they're trying to keep him focused. So there's, they're not, they're not uh, giving him every ounce of truth that they're proud really probably is. I mean, do you think, I mean, you've, you've investigated a lot. Uh, is this the only, this is not the only case you've investigated. Over 100 like this. Yeah, okay. And do you see evidence of, that do you think I that some of these other ones are real? Visitors are trying to persuade their contactee to a particular kind of belief that they want to advocate. You do not see that? I do. You do? In, in most cases, yeah. Yeah. They, 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 once they make contact, they try to guide him. Are most of them, are, are most of them humans? No, they're about one third humans, about one third what we typically call greys now, and the other third is a catch-all category that includes all the rest of them: avioids and uh, amphibioids and bug-type creatures, intelligent creatures of all kinds. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are they all carbon-based life forms? Not, not all. There's, there's some life forms that have exoskeletons like insects, that, that, like the praying mantis type. Yeah, right. they're, as, they're as big as humans. They're as intelligent as humans. They have manipulative digits and have evolved technologies and produce spaceships and travel in space in them. You know, at, at, at my age, at 84 years old now, I've come to a conclusion that I think the natural habitat of human life is space itself that planets are like nests life is incubated in the planets it matures to a, a, a stage where it leaves the planet and never comes back just like birds leaving a nest and they become intelligent evolve a technology produce escape vehicles to get away from the nest and in time they make the escape vehicles perfect habitats and each group that moves aboard one of these habitats eliminates the ills and, and emphasizes the positives until they have a utopian ideal that, that they're living aboard their self-created and self-generating space arc. And they don't have any need to put back, to go back to a planet ever again unless they want, unless some of them want to become adventurous and get on, land on a planet and start a new colony. It goes on for a long time. Because some of these, are in, in my, my experience, there are many different kinds of these huge space arcs. The Platon ship at 10 miles diameter is not the biggest one. 
There are others that are considerably bigger than that. I know one that's 20 kilometers, and well, that's 10 miles, I guess. 12 or so, yeah. Yeah, 13. almost, yeah. It's still they're, pretty they're darn big. big. No, that's, that's a are fat they? cigar shape, yeah. Huh? That's a fat cigar shape. Fat yeah. cigar shape, yeah, yeah. okay. But, uh, yeah, I... <clears throat> then there are some that are grotesque designs that have projections sticking out all over the place. Yeah, we These are descriptions, but no photos, right? No photos. Is yeah. it, every, no, there's nothing else that has clear daylight photos like this, right? Or is no, there? No, no other is as good no. as these. And the reason, re, again, is because they actually posed the ships. There was no problem getting the good pictures. They just flew them slowly before his camera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. I remember you did... Um, a presentation at the showboat on your best photos. Oh, that's a long time ago. That was a long time ago. It was might have been in the. I think it was in the 80s. Yeah. <laughs> but um, you had a copy of, of, of a ship. I thought it was maybe near Puerto Rico, coming out of the ocean with the water falling off of it. Have you seen that yeah, one? Yeah, that, that was that one. That it came out of a bay in Puerto Rico. Yeah. This reminds me that in the Enoch or Henoch prophecies, they talk about. Uh, if there comes a third world war after the U.S. has extended its power, that various countries start turning into alliances with each other against the U.S. and they get help from an E.T. race. It well, says yes. in there. That's an interesting... Uh, well, and it's when, curious because um, in Matthew, when Jesus is talking about those days, he said, if those days will be shortened and if it were not for the elect, you know, all life, you know, that those days would be shortened. And it's similar language to what those Enoch prophecies are saying. Well, that that's in the Talmud Emmanuel. He says, if powerful beings did not intercede as they did in the past, I tell you, no life would remain on the planet. But so, but yeah, they they're will. saying in this Enoch prophecy, it seemed to me, I remember them saying that they will, they will stop basically the U.S. and Russia because they're the ones that are going to have these fabulous weapons. Oh, thank you. Oh, my gosh. Look at this. <laughs> what on earth? Ooh. Uh, <laughs> this is... A uh, little, little of this, a little of that. Get some coffee. Good first, night. Just huh? uh, I just want to? Huh? I better to get a little, too, I think. All right. Two coffees, Dave? Coffee? No. no. Just two? Just That's two. a wine, maybe. Oh, my goodness. I don't... Very cobbler. This is a red, a, a red grapefruit brulee. Is that what that is? Yeah. Did you pick all these dishes out? Yeah. God, it's wow, all really great. Thank you. Mm. This, I've never had anything like this in my life. To tell you the truth. Now you come to my parties, and I just I go crazy on food. I love to cook. My wife doesn't cook. Thank you. So uh, you're kidding. So I so I do 99 percent of the cooking in the house which means we do eat out a lot. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I do do a lot of cut. I'm a good cook. <clears throat> Dave will tell you, I've put together a lot of really scrumptious meals. And, uh, but, wow. Uh, you know, this is a, this is a, I get a, a my Jeez. wife and I, favorite club, and uh, you know, we come here a lot. Changing shape, color, and tone, all at the same time, how would you pronounce it or write it? Sounds all like their, Prince's name. Yeah, yeah, all, yeah. Their, all their names are like that, so you can only be transmitted telepathically. The play are informally so, known as Semyazi. He says, yeah. well, what's Semyazi? She, she said, well, that was a name for recognition, but she says it does have meaning for you. He said, what about Quetzal? She said, that also has meaning for you from, from your past. Ta, same thing. So those are, none of those are their real names. Their real names couldn't be written or pronounced, but those were names that for, for recognition, for ability to associate with them for recognition. They all had relationships with him at one point or another in the past. Yeah, Wendell shared that, uh, that the group that's around him, a lot of them have been with him through other incarnations. Now, Wendell, you were talking about uh, a trip that uh, Wendell was taken into one of the pyramids where they found a doctor. Oh, that was, yeah, yeah. He, he was still with the, being met, encountering Ascot. <clears throat> and she took him to the pyramids one time landed there was a bedouin camp being set up there landed right beside of it and she reached in a drawer and handed him a little device about the size of a zippo lighter and says put this on your belt and he says what's that for and she says that'll keep them from seeing us it was a cloaking device 
She put one in her belt. They left the ship, walked right through the Bedouin camp, through a tent where they were preparing a Bedouin girl for a, a, a wedding or something. And a bunch of women were working around her, sitting on a stool in the tent. And they stopped, Meyer was, looked at, they're fixing her hair. And on impulse, he bent down and kissed her on the lips like that. And she jumped up and the women scattered and, uh, and asked, he says, what did you do that for? He said, oh, I just want to see what would happen. <laughs> so they went on through the tent, unobserved, and they went to uh, the Great Pyramid and to a, pi a place on the pyramid where there was a, a, uh, an aperture and a guard, an Egyptian guard. They walked right past the Egyptian guard. He didn't see him at all. And down to a, uh, this might not have been the pyramid, might in the, the valley of the tombs there. <coughs> she took him to a tomb that she said the English had opened years ago and they, they opened it with dynamite and started a fire in the tomb and the Egyptians found out about it and they ran the English off and put the guard on the tomb. The tomb had been guarded ever since. She said, there's something interesting here I want to show you. And she took him to a corner of the, of the room where there was burned uh, evidence of, of a, burn, a fire in the corner. She stirred in the ashes and pulled out a little piece of paper about that long and about that wide singed on all sides and handed it to him. He said, he, she said, here, you may find this interesting. <clears throat> and he looked at it and he said, how will I find this interesting? It's in a strange language. I can't read it. She said, here, I'll help you. Give me your pencil. And he gave her his pencil. She wrote German equivalent letters under a few of the characters on this little piece of paper. And she says, that, may, that ought to be enough. You can put, work it out from there. So I found that in his desk drawer when I was going through the desk drawer looking at stuff. I said, what's this? He told me the story. And I, I said, well, what does it say? She, he says, I haven't tried to work it out. I said, well, let's see what we can do with it. So the, there wasn't a full German alphabet there. We had to reconstruct enough words till they would make a phrase, and then we could accept that as possibly correct. And then we could extend it a little bit. And we made, identified more German letters for the missing characters until we had a pretty good representation. By the time, it took us several hours to do this. By the time we got done, it, the, the, the main message on it was a, just a one paragraph part of, out of a page and said the, the, the line of prophets is as follows. And it started with Enoch, Elijah, Elisha, and on down the line of seven prophets that he had already been told were past incarnations of his. And we got down to the last word, the seventh incarnation as a prophet. And when we converted the, the words to German letters, it spelled B-I-L-L-I. -L -L -I. And his eyes looked up at me, and I looked at him, and I, he said, he didn't say anything. He looked like mouth open, and my mouth was open, and we were looking at each other, wondering, could they be, could that have been a, their spelling of it or what? And I, I was always puzzled by that, because he was truly surprised when we reached that last part <laughs> And it said B I L L I went like that. So you and he did the translation. Pardon? You and he did the you, translation. You, he and I did the translation, and then we got Michael Hessman to read the whole thing in, in right context. And okay. it, it said this is the, the, the line of succession of the prophets of such and such. It occurs to me you have a sample of her handwriting. Uh, it's in the book, well, it's on, uh, in, in the Messages, Volume 2. What's it in? The the, uh, the the book the, the pic photograph of the of the piece of paper yes the, the letters that she put on it I, in the stages her letters and our edition of the letters and the finished translation and and what book yeah. is that in I think it's in the first part of message two okay all right is that the picture book Something or your, has of your preliminary investigation it's part photographs there. and it's before the the book starts it's, uh, I the told contact that. notes too yeah contact okay. message contact notes. I've got that if that's it okay oh interesting. Huh. Wow. You know, um, I, I mentioned about the skepticism of the UFO community. Some of the people I really respect have, have basically been pretty tough on the... Jacques Vallée is one. I mean, he's a great great man and great great researcher. And, and Stan Friedman has done a heck of a lot. My question is whether or not they've had a chance to do very much of the research. Because that was one of the things I found when I was interviewing ufologists about this, is that they basically had turned their backs on it because they felt they'd been shut out. And yeah, I don't know they, if they somewhere... they don't even want to read it, yeah. Well, I mean, I think that they, they felt they'd been shut out by you. 
that they they did not have an opportunity to do firsthand work or analysis or whatever. I don't I don't know what what uh, what they tried to do or what they tried access they tried to do. I'm sure they very few of them tried to go over and meet Let with me Billy Meyer. Let me tell you a story. You mentioned Stan Friedman, right after the first article in Saga magazine, just a short article. Friedman flew to Tucson and he came to my house, rented a car and came to my house. He said, "Can I see some of that Pleiadian material?" And I said, "Sure." I showed him the pictures that I had at the time and some of the contact notes, and he says, Jesus Christ, he says, do you know, uh, you know, he says, I've got connections. I can get this analyzed properly. Why don't you let me take it? I said, well, we're already in Kodak International and all the big photo facilities studying the pictures. We got, we're, we, we don't need any help. We, we're already, other people are interested, they're already here. He says, you mean you're not going to let me in on it? And I said, no, oh, how can we let you on it? Can, can you afford to go back and forth to Switzerland? We can't carry on our back. We can't fund you. <laughs> he says, Jesus Christ, you're going to hog all this to yourself? And he turned around and walked, stomped out of my house, got in his rented car, and, and attacked the case ever since. Wow. So, he came to a <clears throat> presentation of mine in Hawaii two and a half years ago and just sat there, wouldn't talk, never introduced himself to me. Um, I, I think, it, and I didn't know that he'd come to your place because there's always a feeling like there's something about he doesn't want to he doesn't want to reveal something, and maybe it's his own. Uh, he refused to look at the case after that. Yeah, and, and and he would have to show that he has interest in something that he doesn't really have authority in, and it's much easier for some of the people to to try and be dismissive, but really. Where do you see photographs like this? Where do you see films like this? Where do you see metallurgists from 22 years ago or more getting up and saying, well, I can't make this, and here's what it's made out of, and, and sound recordings, three different sound studios that I know of, seven or eight different sound engineers that all went through the sounds and said, well, with calculated yeah. formula showing that there's eight inaudible frequencies, uh, the patterns are so discreet and the, the shifting is so fat, we can't duplicate them, we don't know what the sound source is. <coughs> you know, but, they the, the one recording that was recorded on four recorders simultaneously. So we had stereo, stereo recording. His wife was holding an Iowa shoulder recorder that had a, a needle on it. And there were two smaller recorders. I don't remember the make anymore, but they were just a little when you push the buttons on to, to turn them on and off. And Billy was right under the craft at Obersidling where the log pile mm -hmm. is. And his wife and 13 other people were standing about three quarters of a mile away on the top of the hill where you're looking down on the log pile. And the craft was right over Billy's head. And the sound was so loud to Billy that, first of all, the needle in his recorder went clear with a distort and stayed there, stuck on the high side pin. And the sound was so loud he had to take his jacket off and wrap it around his head, hold it tight until the sound lasted about 20 minutes. And when it stopped, he was stone deaf is he could barely see and his head was splitting with a splitting headache and the, uh, the his wife and the other witnesses from the group that had the other recorder also was pegged at the top distort range uh, but she copied a little clearer than his and, and and both of them were pretty good recordings the two small recorders stopped running after about a minute and 30 seconds of, of the, the noise because of I guess because of the loud audibility, because he took them to a repair shop the next day and they worked all right then, again. They just had copied a few seconds and quit. Uh, now, while they were doing this, a group of people ran into the scene from a little town, three kilometers, that's a mile and a half away, down the hill, running, looking for the noise source and came into the scene before it stopped. But they didn't see the craft because it was only, they had only opened the screen in Billy's direction. And his wife and, and the other witnesses couldn't see the ship from the side. They hadn't opened the screen in that direction. So there's always a question about how much they actually saw. They saw the tape recorders working. They heard the sound. They saw Billy <coughs> hunching down with his jacket around his head. And, and they, they witnessed his, his eyes were completely bloodshot. He, he got black eyes from the tissue from... Mm -hmm. The sound. So when we got it out in Michael Pinder's studio out in, in California, 
and we're trying to get it that loud to see what it felt like. And with all the audio gear he had, we couldn't get it loud enough to, to duplicate what Billy experienced. And then we took it over to Michael Pinder's shop. And, and he did, we did the same thing there, and, and he didn't have as good of equipment as, as, as uh, Neil Diamond. But, uh, and, and we took it to another shop, one more shop besides that out in Hollywood, tried to do the same thing. They're the ones that put it on a scope where we could watch the changing patterns of the, the, the various different frequencies emitted simultaneously. There were 24 frequencies simultaneously emitted and all very varying in, in a random sequence so that they would all fall on a line only occasionally in the same line. Then they would split and the, the screen would just be covered with a, a wide pattern of, of all the waves overlapping each other. And then they'd sink back together where <coughs> they'd have a pretty mm -hmm. running pretty much together again but once every minute and a half or so. George, I think Wendell's talked with us before at some of these meetings on some of the other investigators, and I seem to remember uh, your discussion when you guys initially introduced the photo book at a UFO meeting, right? Mm -hmm. You and Lee and Britt were there, and you were greeted with, I mean, skepticism and derision, right? Oh, yeah. It had just come off the press, and we'd <clears> gone to... Uh, APRO 79, I think they called it. It was a, an APRO UFO conference out in San Diego. And we took <coughs> three boxes of the books. We hadn't even opened them yet to the, up to the conference with us. And while everybody was milling around getting registered and everything, we opened the first box. And people came by and, 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 and picked them up and looked at them and ooing and aahing. And, and Coral got a little upset. And she came over and closed the box and put it under her table. <laughs> and went back to registering people, but people that started doing that dragged the box out and opened it again and started all over again. Uh, and in the course of this, there was a guy that uh, we later identified as Fred Bell. Who, mm -hmm. he, he, he followed us out to our car when we took the box back outside. He bought the other two boxes from the trunk of the car. And then he came to Tucson and bought two more cases of, of books, 10 books to a case. I asked him, what are you doing with him? He said, oh, I got a lot of friends in Hollywood. He was passing them out to his Hollywood friends and telling them that he was in contact with Semyasi too and that she had a <laughs> picket ship for his red apple, candy apple red van that protecting him. And that uh, then he went and wrote a book with Brad Steiger where he starts tell, uh, telling how he met Semyasi when he woke up one time. He saw the ship. His next recollection, he was laying in the ship, laying with his head on her lap, and she was stroking him in yeah. his brow and, 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 and waking him up. Boy. And and went on from there, and, and the rest is all total fiction, right? out of Hey, if he's going to tell a lie about being laying with Sanyazi, yeah. it could be better than that. He's <laughs> <laughs> not stroking his forehead. Really? Uh, well, I think yeah, dinner's going to be served about 8.30. Do you guys need to reset up for uh, around the table? Yes, we do. Okay. Yeah, I'd love for you to follow Why don't we take a little break? information. Yeah, sure. And I know it.